Okay, okay, G Jesus people, it it's a long game. What do you think that I've been doing? I have a real job too, you know. I'm a busy fucking guy, but, but whatever, fine. You win. I'll play Library of Ruina. But there is no way that it will ever live up to Lobotomy Corporation. Oh, holy shit. Welcome to Library of Ruina, the sequel to popular SCP-themed game Lobotomy Corporation, which I also made a video about, and you should probably check it out first so that you can get more of my callback jokes. While Lobotomy is a management simulator with a background plot, a library is a story-driven turn-based card battler. Yeah, so it's a bit different. While that's certainly a huge departure from its predecessor, I actually enjoy Library of Ruina a lot more. Perhaps it's simply because I like card battlers, or perhaps because they made Hod so fucking cute, but the general consensus towards this game is very positive. This might be a longer video because there's a lot to talk about, so I should probably hurry the fuck up. Also, since this game focuses a lot on story, I'll be introducing some plot lines, but I'll do my best to avoid any big spoilers. Alright, let's go. This is Roland, essentially the main character of the story you witness during Library of Ruina. Unlike in Lobotomy Corporation, where you literally played as a site director in Library, you're more of a spectator to this man's story. Roland is a simple Grade 9 fixer, essentially a very low-level mercenary in the city, until one day he mysteriously finds himself in the library and meets Angela, who kindly kills him. Yippee! Luckily, the power of knowledge revives him, and he begins to work for his new librarian queen, where he meets and is assisted by a variety of very hot librarians. Wait, that sounds pretty familiar. Also, everyone is even hotter than the last game somehow, it, it's honestly incredible. The library is an anomaly itself, basically a pocket dimension that can only be reached through mysterious invitations that magically arrive to people. However, Roland never received one, and it's unclear just how he reached the library in the first place. But regardless, Angela puts him to work receiving guests. See, the books in this library are special. Every book is a person. Literally. When a guest dies in the library, they become a book, and their life story, dreams, fighting style, even their clothing is transcribed onto the pages. With enough books, you can also do... well whatever you want, actually. The most popular uses are as follows. Read the secrets of your friends, find out how the world began, make a massive cityscape that stretches to infinity, copy your opponent's moves with almost perfect mimicry, harness demons to make a nice cup of coffee, become human to think and gain your own feelings, transform people to horribly warp their body, grow some wings and fly around with fire spears to impale all your enemies and slowly go insane as you realize that you're trapped here forever and you can never truly escape and that you've doubted yourself your entire life and that your life is potentially meaningless because you only get your teammates killed. Basically, you can do anything with the books in the library because they're infinitely powerful if you have the right combination of words. And holy shit, this game is beautiful. What an art style, I love it. So what is the goal of the library? Well, Angela is trying to create the perfect book. Basically, by amassing books with more powerful words, she's going to assemble a book that allows her and the librarians to leave because they're trapped here. This will slowly happen over time as more people get invited to the library and are killed. Interestingly, whenever an invitation is received, the librarians get a flash of what's happening outside of the library which introduces all kinds of lovely characters, from backstreet fixers and desperate thieves all the way to powerful enemies like the Town of Love and the insane members of the Blue Reverberation. There are a lot of factions and storylines to keep track of in this game, and watching the web unfold as connections are made is really interesting, especially since there's a lot of mystery built up. Why are the librarians back from Lobotomy Corporation? Why exactly does Angela want to leave the library? What's the connection to Lobotomy Corporation and the other companies in this game? And maybe the biggest question, why does Roland seem to know everything about everyone, even the legendary fighters in the city, if he's just a lowly grade 9 fixer? The dialogue in this game is really good too, it actually feels like humans talking in this fucked up world that they live in. 
And the best part, unlike Lobotomy Corporation, Library has voice acting. It's all in Korean, but even if I can't understand what they're saying, the voices are perfect for all the characters. Especially my beloved Chesed. Oh, I love him so much. They speak with really good inflection and emotion, I just wish that I could understand a single word. I would love to talk about the story in incredible detail, but I really need to convince you to play this game, so I'll stop there. The story for this game is pretty fucking complicated, but the gameplay is even more so. In fact, I highly recommend that you take a break from watching this video in order to attend a high-level college for four to six years in order to get a degree in medical sciences before continuing. Past this point, I will simply assume that you have either taken my advice and are now a genius, or you're incredibly lazy. Both are honestly fine, we don't judge here. For each fight in the story, you need books. These books will entice the next group of people in the story to visit the library, and it's how the story expands. For example, a group of fixers known as the Molar Office hear of the library after another fixer group disappears into it. They take a warp train, a super fast method of travel, but get stuck within, forcing them to use an invitation to teleport to the library. The gaze office, who were monitoring the train trying to steal its technology, notice this, sending them into the library searching for answers. Meanwhile, the people on the train witness the fixers disappear and begin to go insane, slowly forming Love Town, which are then sent to invade the library, and so on and so forth. I mean, that, that's cool and all, but what happens when they enter the library? Well, that's where your librarians come in. The library has a bunch of floors, each with a head librarian that specializes in a certain topic. They are used to fight off these visitors. You select what floor you want to use, and you're thrown onto a stage. Are you ready for a mechanic dump? Because this game is absurdly complicated, and we're just starting combat. First things first, each character has a few features. Their health, which is self-explanatory. Their stagger, which upon hitting zero increases all damage dealt to them and forces them to skip their next turn. And their light, which is basically like mana. A bit regenerates every turn and more powerful cards cost more light to use. At the beginning of each turn, or act as it's called in the game, every character will roll a certain number of speed dice. For simplicity, we'll say that all these characters have one each, but I'll explain in a bit on how to get more. The higher the number rolled on the speed die, the higher you are in the turn order. Once speed dice are rolled, you can select one combat page for each slot as well as a target for that action. Combat pages are composed of two main things, the light cost and a series of actions. These actions are split into two groups, attack and defense. There are three types of attacks, being Pierce, Blunt, and Slash, which deal bonus damage depending on your target's resistances, kinda like Pokemon. Defensive dice only have two types, but while all attack dice simply deal their damage, defensive dice vary wildly in what they do. Their two types are Block or Evade, and I'm about to explain just what the fuck that actually means. After pages are selected, the battle phase begins, and each unit will use their action on their target, rolling dice equal to the values on the card. But when two characters use a combat page on each other, a clash begins, which is the meat and potatoes of the combat system. When a clash occurs, dice are rolled against each other, and a variety of things can happen depending on what dice clash. For example, if two attack dice clash, they both roll and the higher number deals that much damage to the loser. If two block dice, or a block and an evade dice are rolled against each other, the winner deals some stagger damage to the enemy or recovers some stagger resistance. 
However, if an attack die is rolled against a defense die and the attacker wins, the attacker deals damage equal to their roll minus the defense roll. If the defender wins, the attacker takes stagger damage instead. If an attack wins against an evade, the evader takes all of that damage, but if the evader wins, the attack is completely negated. Now if you listen to all that and thought to yourself, holy fuck this man has rampant paranoid schizophrenia, I have bad news, because that's just the basic gameplay loop. You see, the mechanics of this game can be a bit hard to handle. Someone who isn't familiar with turn-based games or card battlers will probably be very confused by this system when they start playing. Which means there probably aren't any of them still watching because they all killed themselves during the last paragraph. Without explaining every mechanic like intercepting attacks or all of the status effects, just know that it gets a lot more complex, with some of the late game boss fights taking upwards of 30 minutes because they have so many abilities and stages. All that would just take too long to talk about, so let's move on instead. Every unit in your entire library has a deck of 9 combat pages. These pages are obtained through opening Hearthstone packs that guests you defeat turn into and contain two types of cards of varying rarities. First are combat pages, which in order of rarity can be paperback, hardcover, limited, and object de art. Or if you hate thinking like I do, you can just call them the Hearthstone rarities of common, rare, epic, and Whoa, legendary. You can have a maximum of three copies of any one card in a unit's deck, except for legendaries, which you can only have one copy of per deck. Typically, as cards get more rare, they'll generally get better, with legendaries being incredibly powerful. Similarly, the other card type you can get in packs have the same rarities, and these are called key pages. Key pages are equipped separately from your deck, and provide passive bonuses like making certain types of attacks deal more damage or adding status effects to attacks. While your deck is very important to think about and should be carefully crafted to synergize with other librarians on the floor, key pages can often mean the difference between a fight taking 30 tries or one-shotting every enemy on the first attempt. Like combat pages, legendary key pages are limited, you can only get one of each, period. While you can have multiple legendary combat pages and put one copy of each in different decks, if you get a legendary key page, you can only use it with one of your librarians. Since the passives on legendary pages are so massive, it's almost always beneficial to use as many of these as possible and to build specific decks for those pages. Speaking of pages, you can actually upgrade them. As you progress through the game, your key pages will get more points. Every passive on a key page has a point value, and the better it is, the more that it costs. Key pages don't gain additional passives on their own, but if your point limit is high enough, you can use other key pages to add passives to them, essentially letting you build your own class, which is super cool. Also, uh, pro tip, if you want to play the game on easy mode, just use passives on all of your key pages that increase stagger damage. Staggering enemies is by far the most broken thing in the game because, as previously mentioned, not only does it drastically increase the damage you deal to an enemy, it also makes them skip their next turn. If you've ever played D&D, you're a nerd. Also, you might have heard of the action economy. Basically, the action economy means that the more moves someone gets, the stronger they are. If you have a level 100 boss dragon that only does one move a turn, odds are a group of five that can move twice a turn each can probably beat it pretty easily. The same goes for library, as having more actions than an opponent simply means that you get to whoop their ass, and staggering them makes it feel like the Sar Bomba is slapping their cheeks. But wait, there's more! Have you ever wanted to kick someone's ass even fucking harder? Introducing abnormality and ego pages. Throughout the game, you'll be presented with a series of missions to complete for each floor, and each time you complete them, you'll have the opportunity to enter the book of an abnormality. The horrifying and powerful SCP-like creatures of Lobotomy Corporation didn't fade into obscurity after all. They're still here, waiting. Each of these battles has a gimmick of some sort, like a condition that you need to fulfill or an ability you need to keep track of, and are a major shakeup to the normal gameplay loop. Upon completion of a suppression like this, you will be awarded with three abnormality pages. These pages come in two types, and are unique to certain floors, so you should try to build decks on that floor around those pages. The two types are Awakening and Breakdown, and during the battle, you'll get them slowly over time. 
This bar up here at the top represents a motion level, and depending on actions succeeded or failed, each librarian will slowly move it in a certain direction. If the bar is positive, you'll be dealt an awakening card, and if it's negative, you'll have a breakdown card. These are incredibly powerful effects that usually have significant drawbacks, but can help change the tide of battle significantly. But there's a second use to the emotion gauge that can only be used much later in the game. Ego cards. After completing all of a floor's missions, you'll be presented with a six-stage boss fight, where you have to defeat every abnormality on that floor. If you succeed, you'll be rewarded with five ego cards, and you obtain one every time a floor goes up an emotion level from that point on. Ego pages are dealt into a separate hand that any librarian can access, and are reusable as more emotion is gained throughout the battle. And believe me, when I say this shit is full of the most broken cards in the game. You can do shit like hit an enemy six times with one card, healing HP for every hit, or destroy all of your opponent's dice, forcing them to skip that action. Honestly, the amount of ways that you can beat someone's ass in this game are basically infinite, and it's fucking awesome. Now I know that was a lot, and believe me, there's a ton more that I could talk about, but that's the basic mechanics down. It's a pretty difficult system to get the hang of, but once you do, the game really falls into a nice flow. When you figure out how to use your attacks effectively, the units on the stage move around almost like a dance, and it's really fucking cool to watch. I've played a lot of card battlers in my time, like Slay the Spire or Monster Train, but Library of Ruina has by far the most in-depth and best system I've ever seen. It's fun, entertaining, and incredibly satisfying. Not only that, but the gameplay and story mesh incredibly well, with this being one of the best written games in my experience. Oh, and uh, don't think this game is easy, either, because it's hard as shit. Wish me luck 100%ing this game, because I'm gonna need it. However, now that we're finished with the gameplay section, you should know by now that I'm legally obligated to talk about the music of any game I play for at least three minutes. And this one's gonna be longer, fuckos. Music is incredibly important to video games. Used correctly, it can drastically improve an experience, allowing the player to become immersed or invested in the world of the game. I made a video on my favorite game soundtracks not too long ago, and I will tell you right now that if I had played Library of Ruina before I made that, it would be on that list in an instant. After playing this game, I literally get goosebumps listening to every song in the soundtrack. Every single one is so good. This is not an exaggeration. This is not a lie, I fucking adore the soundtrack for this game. I want to focus on the battle music because it's what you'll be hearing the most of. First off, before you fight, you'll hear this theme. It's composed of a lot of bass, with percussion at the forefront and some intense strings in the background. But, if you listen close, you can also hear that a gun being readied is used in the soundtrack, which is fucking awesome! The first part is all about preparing for battle, and it's not done yet. There's a second part, where your primary focus is on strings and it speeds up a little as you're moving through screens and getting closer to the fight. The gun sound effect is much more common at this point too, and if you're not paying attention, you might miss that it even changed. Then finally, on the last selection screen, it changes one more time. music kicks into double time, the strings play a new melody, an entirely new bass comes in, and the main melody that's been playing changes to be more suspenseful. It is incredible. This happens every time you prepare for a fight, and it's absolutely perfect for building suspense. Once you're actually in a battle, the theme will shift depending on what floor you're on. 
Every single floor of the library has three different themes that change depending on the emotion level of your librarians during the fight. These songs reflect the head librarian's personality on that floor, like Yisad's being a cold, futuristic theme. Now compare that to Gibura's fucking insane heavy metal track. You might notice a lot of similarities in these as well, because they all use the same melody at some point in them, which is super cool. As previously stated, each battle has three stages that change throughout the fight, so let's take a look at the first floor's battle theme, the Floor of General Works. The first part has a lot of piano and strings, with the background percussion going absolutely wild. The strings have a lot of long rising notes, and the piano is mostly playing long chords to complement it, but as the battle grows more intense, we move on to phase two. You can immediately hear a difference. The piano adds in quick rising and falling notes, everything gets a little faster, and a background bass kicks in. The strings move to much shorter notes as well, moving around a lot more, and overall the theme becomes a lot more high energy. But then we get to three, and it completely changes. This is the peak of the battle, and there aren't any more slow piano chords in the background. That fucking man is playing all over the keyboard. The percussion gets cut at some points to make room for a dramatic sting from the strings, and the bass is accompanied by a heavy electronic synth in the background. This shit is so fucking cool, and it does it for every single floor. The Gibura theme literally sounds like someone is fighting a Dark Souls boss at a heavy metal concert. It is so cool. Listen, let me be real here for a second. I've droned on long enough for this video. Th this is already way past my usual 10 minute reviews. Hell, I have an entire page dedicated to just music in the script. But Library of Ruina really fucking deserves it. Project Moon, the company that made both Lobotomy Corp and Library, are absolutely fantastic. The story that they're weaving is horrifying and beautiful, and their games are some of the most fun I've had in a while. I can't properly describe how these games make me feel without another hour-long section dedicated to it, so just let me say this. While getting near the end of this game, I was legitimately sad because I knew it was going to end. You don't see that much in games, and the fact that I wanted to keep playing this game forever should really give you a good idea of how good it really is. If you haven't played these games already, I highly recommend them. And if you already have, then you should be looking forward to the near future. Project Moon's next game, Limbus Company, is coming out in December of 2022, and you better believe that I'll be there to review it. Memes aside, I am begging you to support Project Moon, because so far everything they've made is an absolute smash out of the park. 
creative, fun, and insanely creepy, there's no better story to get invested in than one continued through these games. Overall, I'd give Library of Ruina one of the highest scores that I can possibly give on this channel. One Roland. Not out of anything, like that. that's the whole score. A beautiful and fantastic game, you can pick it up on Steam for just $30 and severe emotional trauma. However, Library of Ruina, I have just one question. If you didn't want me to repeatedly reopen the game over and over again, then why did you make such a banger of an intro? I'll see you jump soon. Open the Mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, mommy, sorry, mommy.